So, Daniel, you requested that we do a, a sutta. Uh, this is in the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 54. Uh, it's uh, uh, Potalaya Sutta to a guy named Potalaya. Now, the first thing that we can note is, is that all of the 50s, a group of 10, is for lay people. This is a group of uh, suttas for, for lay people. And the first thing that we should understand is, is that the Buddha is speaking the language of this layman. Okay, so with that, we'll go uh, get started on it. Uh, all right, it starts with, thus I have heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the country of the Ankuatara uh, Pans in a town of Apana. Then, when he, in the morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his pot and his sangati, went into Apana for alms. When he had wandered for alms, he had returned from, uh, <clears throat> and after his meal, went to a certain grove for the day's abiding. Having entered the grove, he sat down at the foot of a tree. Um, Potadaya, the householder, was walking and wandering for exercise, wearing full dress with a parasol and sandals. In other words, he was dressed to the teeth. Uh, he also went to the grove, and having entered the grove, he went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When the courteous and agreeable talking was finished, he stood at one side, and the Blessed One said to him, There are seats, householder. Sit down, if you like. When this was said, the householder uh, thought, The recluse Gautama has addressed me as householder. And angry and displeased, he remained silent. So... First off, do you think that the Buddha knew that he was angry and remained silent? Uh, he probably showed it. Yeah. When this was said, the householder uh, Bodhalaya thought, the recluse Gautama addressed me as householder. And angry and displeased, he remained silent. A second time and then a third time, the Blessed One said to him, there are seats, householder, sit down if you like. When this was said, the householder Patiya thought, the recluse Gautama addresses me as householder, and angrily, and angry and displeased, he said to the Blessed One, <coughs> Master Gautama, this is neither fitting nor proper that you address me as a householder. Householder, you have the aspects, marks, and signs of a householder. Now, when I read this a while ago, I was thinking... If it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, <laughs> acts like a duck, it's a duck. And so this is what the Buddha is saying to this householder, that you look like one, you act like one, you talk like one, you've got the marks and the signs of a householder. Nevertheless, Master Gautama, I have given up all my works and cut off all my affairs. Now, we have to understand what they mean by affairs, and that's basically the key word for this sutta. In what way have you given up all your works, householder, and given and cut off all your affairs? Master Dutama, I have given up all my wealth, gained silver, gold to my children and their, as their inheritance without ad, uh, advising or admonishing them. I have uh, merely living on food and clothing, that is how I have given up all the works and cut off my affairs. Householder, the cutting off of affairs as you describe it is one thing, but in the noble dis dis discipline, the cutting off of affairs is different. What is the cutting off of affairs like the noble one's dis uh, discipline, Venerable Sir? It would be good, Venerable Sir, if the Blessed One would teach me the Dhamma, showing what the cutting off of affairs is like in the noble dis discipline. Listen, householder, and attend wisely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir. Patamaya, the householder, replied, 
and said this, householder, there are these eight things in the noble one's dis discipline that lead to the cutting off of affairs. Now, it sounds kind of like precepts. In fact, it starts off that way. What are the eight? With the support of non-killing of living beings, the killing of beings is to be abandoned. With the support of taking only what is given, the taking of what is not given is to be abandoned. With the support of truthful speech, false speech is to be abandoned. With the support of non-malicious speech, malicious speech is to be abandoned. With the support of refraining from repressious greed, repressious greed is to be abandoned. With the support of refraining from spiteful scolding, spiteful scolding is to be abandoned. With the support of refraining from angry despair, angry despair is to be abandoned. With the support of non-arrogance, arrogance is to be abandoned. With these eight things stated in brief, without being uh, expounded in detail, that is what the cutting off of affairs is in one's noble discipline. All right. So basically, it's kind of a summary, starts off in the precepts and winds up talking about arrogance, angry despair, rapacious greed, and malicious speech. Uh, this is basically what the Buddha can see that uh, uh, this householder has. He was angry. Uh, and arrogance. Arrogant, exactly. Okay. Venerable sir, it would be good if out of compassion, the blessed one would expound to me in detail these eight things that lead to the cutting off of the affairs of the noble one's dis discipline, which have been stated in brief by the blessed one without being expanded in detail. Then listen, householder, and attend closely to what I shall say. This is something that I hear the Buddha often say, and in fact, it might be a good thing to repeat when you're talking to people, is then listen and attend closely to what I shall say. In other words, don't argue, just listen. <laughs> then, Venerable Sir, uh, Potilaya, the householder replied, the Blessed One said this, with the support of non-killing of living beings, the killing of living beings is to be abandoned, so it is said, and without reference to what it is said, here a noble disciple considers us, I am practicing the way of the abandoning and the cutting off of the, uh, the fetters because of which I might kill living beings. If I were to kill living beings, I would blame myself for doing so. The wise having investigated would censure me for doing so and on the dissolution of the body after death because of the killing of living beings an unhappy destination would be expected but this killing of living beings is itself a fetter and a hindrance and while taints vexation and fever might arise through the killing of living beings there is there are no taints, vexation, and fever in one who abstains from the killing of living beings. So it is with reference to this that it is said, with the support of non-killing of living beings, killing of beings is abandoned. All right, so let's talk about that a little bit. First off, he's talking to a householder. And the householder obviously believes in rebirth and reincarnation, so the Buddha is putting that point in also. But there's another point, and that is, is that when you kill an animal, like a horse or a cow, it takes a lot of work. If you kill that dog, you've got a dog carcass you've got to deal with. Right? So, um, in the West, we tend to want to take things to an absolute rather than finding a middle path. And so people say, well, that means that you can't kill bugs, you can't kill lice, you can't kill uh, ticks, you can't kill fleas, you can't kill uh, bacteria that has invaded the body. <laughs> and the answer to that is, is that that's ridiculous, that killing of animals 
in fact, the whole point of it was is that animal killing, animal sacrifice was done for religious reasons. That people would kill goats and cows and sheep and whatnot for the gods. And then the Brahmins would pray over while they killed it, and then they get the beef. <laughs> but Westerners want to take that to an absolute extreme, and somewhere in there, there's a middle path. Like, uh, let us say, killing a kitten that's the size of a hand, that's going to take work. But putting flea powder on a dog that's actually going to be helpful to the dog. And so there's a limit about what a, a, a living being is. We can't go to the absolute that, in fact, in many cases, not killing is going to be vexation, is going to be trouble. Because those little animals are uh, insect bites, etc., like that. Uh, now, we can let an animal like a, a mosquito go that, in fact, are easy to deal with. But when an animal uh, uh, is invading a dog and, and the dog is covered with fleas, then it's a good idea to uh, put the dog in sheep dip or something, give the dog a shot, put powder, uh, flea powder on the dog or something like that for the relief and the benefit of the dog. So I want to make that point clear that in the time of the Buddha, the Buddha was not even considering that small insects were living beings. But in our lifetime, here now, we do. Go ahead. Uh, so mosquitoes... Uh... Yeah, this is, I think, the first bug that everyone thinks of when they when they see the precepts, you cannot kill any living being. Right. Okay. So, well, here's the point is, is that if a bug uh, like a mosquito is biting you and you see it and you slap it and kill it while it's still feeding on you, you leave the snout inside your own skin to get infected. It's better to let the mosquitoes go. One of the things you could do, for instance, if the mosquito is there, is to wave your hand and the mosquito will leave. He'll, he'll pick his mouth up and he'll walk off. He'll fly away. But if you swat that mosquito while he's actually biting you, you're going to cause yourself vexation and pain. Mm, okay. But putting up a mosquito coil is a good idea because the mosquitoes, they don't like smoke. In fact, to be honest with you, that's what I did because the mos it's, it's a cool day today, the mosquitoes are out. And so before this call, I set off a mosquito coil. Yeah, what I <laughs> do This is what my... they look like. Ah, right, yeah. What I do in my bathroom is uh, there are a lot of mosquitoes where, because there's like water standing still, so they like to breathe there. Mm -hmm. And every time I go to the bathroom, like there are so many mosquitoes, so I can't really sit there at ease. So I just started like killing them all. And now I'm wondering like, is it a bad thing or a good thing? Well, in, there you go. Now you've got vexation and fever because you are killing the mosquitoes. Yeah, but right. it's mainly about the guilt or like the Right, is that because you I... read a precept and didn't understand it? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay, so maybe what you can do is two things. One is just to put a mosquito coil in the bathroom, in the toilet, and then all the adult mosquitoes will leave. The second thing that you can do is you can continue every time you go into the bathroom, stir that container of water. You keep stirring it and stirring it, and then the lava with a mosquito coil and stirring of the water, you won't have the insects there anymore. Okay, sounds like a good idea. Yes, that's a good idea, rather than killing them. Because for one thing, there's too many of them. If your desire is to kill mosquitoes, there's going to be no end to it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. 
that in fact you're breeding them just so that you can kill them. So pouring out that standing water and replenishing it would be helpful. Stirring it up every time that you go to the toilet that you stir up that water. Putting mosquito coil in there and you very quickly no longer have a mosquito issue. But if you keep killing them, you'll have that vexation and worry. All right. Now we can take the part about the Buddha talking about uh, dying and then still be in vexation because you were killing animals. Because that's the belief system that the guy had. The reality is, is that nobody knows what happens after death. But he used it this way, and then in fact the Buddha speaks in the language of the ordinary person quite often, and that confuses people who read the suttas. They believe stuff, and they believe that the Buddha believed it, when in fact the Buddha didn't believe in anything. That's what the sutta is about, is dropping the affairs, and one of the affairs is rebirth and reincarnation. That's one of the things I believe in. So I'll get in a great big fight with somebody who doesn't believe it <laughs> or vice versa. I don't believe in it. And so when people come, uh, or actually, I believe that it doesn't exist. But you can take the neutral position. You can cut off that affair and say it doesn't matter. We don't know. All right. So then he's going to talk about the killing. With the support of taking only what is given, the taking of what is not given will be abandoned. Now, this is an important point about taking what is not given. Suppose somebody, let us say that you've got a store clerk who gives you the wrong change. She what? gave it to you, but she didn't intend to give it to you. She made a mistake. And so you walk out of the store. Are you going to be happy or unhappy because you got more change, maybe 25 cents, maybe $2 more than you uh, bargained for? Depends on if you're intending to be honest or in, intending to be greedy. Or perhaps it depends upon the situation, for instance, that she may have to make up for that. That's what happens uh, in Thailand. And yeah. She didn't intend to give it to you, and so she made a mistake, and she's going to have to pay for that mistake. So in order to help people, then in fact, that happened to me one time a long time ago. In fact, it was in India at the time when I had a beef about the, the room, thinking that I had paid when in fact uh, the, this, uh, the, this clerk that was at the desk was saying that I hadn't paid. And while I was arguing with her over it, this guy came up to me and says that she will have to make up for it if you don't pay your bill. And uh, that's what caused me to pay my bill. I actually coughed up and paid the bill. Whether I was overpaying or not was not the important point. The point was is that to not cause her any harm or any damage. So this is the point about taking what is not given is actually has to be given. Now, here's a question about taking things that are not given. What about charging money for something that you should be giving them free? Like the Dhamma. Like the Dhamma. Or how about charging people for air? You, you, uh, 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 you let them into your hotel and then you charge them extra for breathing the air that's in the room. <laughs> Uh, I mean, if you know it's it's if you know it's unreasonable, then you're gonna you're gonna heat up because mm -hmm. of that. Because right. you know it's not right. This is why uh, it is phrased like that: is taking things that are not freely given. In other words, business. Because if you buy something, it's not freely given. You got to pay for it. But the other way around is, what if you're giving something that doesn't really belong to you and you charge them money for it? 
So you're taking money and they're not giving you the money. This is the way that the monks operate is, is that they give it free. And if you appreciate the gift, then you'll give something back. And now you've got two acts of generosity. That's much more noble than buying and selling. And that's, by the way, what uh, the big issue with Western Buddhism is, is that Buddhism is no longer a gift-giving arrangement. It's become buying and selling. They oh, sell yeah. the Dhamma, and they don't even own the Dhamma. How can they possibly sell something that they don't own? Yeah. All right. So, let's continue on. Uh, uh, it's actually ellipsed here about uh, truthful speech, malicious speech, refraining uh, from suspicious greed, um, from spiteful scolding, from angry despair, and for arrogance. With the support of non-arrogance, arrogance is to be abandoned. So to, it was said, and with reference to what was said, these, there, here, a noble uh, disciple considers thus, I am practicing the way of abandoning and cutting off of these fetters because of which I might be arrogant. If I, in other words, what he just said there was, is that if I do cut off my, my fetters, I'm better than you are because you ain't <laughs> cut them off yet. <laughs> If I were to be arrogant, I would blame myself. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. And if thus is, uh, but the wise, having investigated, would censure me for this and own the dissolution of the body after death and because of the arrogance and unhappy destination would be expected. In other words, uh, after dissolution of the body and after death is not necessary. We could just say that afterwards, upon being arrogant, we're going to be in the destination of, I didn't like being arrogant in front of that kid, okay? But this arrogance in itself is a fetter. It's a hindrance. And while uh, taints, vexation, and fever might arise through arrogance, there are no taints, no vexation in favor for one who is not arrogant. So it is with reference to this that it was said, with the support of non-arrogance, arrogance is to be abandoned. These eight things that lead to the cutting off of affairs of the noble ones have now been expounded in detail, but the cutting off of the affairs of the noble ones has yet not yet achieved entirely in all ways. In other words, these eight is not quite enough. Mm, right. Venerable sir, how is the cutting off of the affairs in one's noble disciple achieved entirely and in all ways? It would be good, venerable sir, if the blessed one would teach me the Dhamma, showing me how the cutting off of the affairs in the noble disciple is uh, discipline is achieved entirely and in all ways. And so the Buddha says again, listen, householder, and attend wisely to what I shall say. And then the Buddha gives one, two, three, four, five, six, seven examples. And they're all about this sensuality. The first one is a dog. The householder, suppose a dog, overcome by hunger and weakness, were waiting at the butcher shop. Then a skilled butcher or some apprentice would cover off a skeleton of meatless bones smeared with blood and toss it to the dog. What do you think, householder? Would that dog get rid of the hunger and weakness of gnawing on such a skeleton of meatless bones and smeared with blood? No, venerable sir. Why is that? Because the skeleton consisted only of meatless bones smeared with blood, eventually that dog would reap weariness and disappointment. So too, householder and noble disciples considers thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to a skeleton by the Buddha. They provide much suffering, and obviously it takes a lot of work to gnaw on a bone. <laughs> 
and yet there's not going to be anything there. While the danger is there is great. In other words, when the dog is chewing on a bone, another dog may try to come take it. It may wear down his teeth. I've seen dogs gnaw and chew and whatnot like that. Having seen dust, as it actually is, with proper wisdom, he avoids the uh, uh, the equanimity that is uh, diversified. Here, one, uh, based on diversity and develops uh, equanimity that is unified based on uh, unity when uh, clinging to the mental material things of the world utterly ceased without remainder. All right, so the first thing is, is that the Buddha is probably referencing him, the fact that this dude who says that he has uh, given up all the affairs is dressed to the nines. He's well-dressed. He's got a parasol, not just an ordinary umbrella, but a parasol for the heat. He's probably got a fancy doodads on it. He probably stole it from some girl or his wife or something. <laughs> okay. And wearing probably very fancy sandals. And yet he says that he's cutting off with the affairs. So the Buddha is talking here about sensuality of having fine goods and whatnot. Now there's a, there's a side point about the dog and the bone. And that is, is that bones generally have marrow and so the dog would get some nourishment by uh, chewing on the bone to get down to the marrow then he's going to get some nurture there but you could also say that what about uh, bones that have been completely cooked and completely boiled so that there's no meat no marrow no blood just a white bone therein the dog is not going to get any substance, but boy do those dogs like to chew on that bone. And humans do that too. The bones are numerous. How about a Lamborghini? <laughs> Fully decked out. It's still just a bone. And those Lamborghini drivers, they gnaw on that bone. Now how about fancy clothes and going to fancy concerts? They're empty. You don't get any real substance out of them. What about, um, for example, I have knee pain in my left knee. So I bought a pair of high quality flip flops so that I don't have any pain in my knees. But now they are saying like, oh, we'll probably have to take them away because they are too luxurious. Well, why don't you rough them up? Can you have the quality that they help your knee when also does not have the quality of people being envious and wanting to take them away from you? It was also about the, the sole being too thick, I think. Not sure. Okay. Not sure about that because you can, in fact, talk about that is that that's medicine. Mm. Okay, yeah. just like I mentioned to you the other day about giving monks honey, because honey is considered a medicine. So if right. you need the shoes, you don't have to say they're luxurious, you can, in fact, rough them up, dirty them up, mm -hmm. mess them up. But yeah. they still have the quality of being the medicine that helps to uh, your knee. And so there's a mental path in there always. Yeah. All right. So the next ones would be, what if a vulture grabbed a piece of meat and flew away with it? And then the other vultures and the other animals came and started pecking on that vulture who's trying to protect that meat. Do you think that that vulture might get injured or maybe even killed while he's trying to protect the meat that the other ones want? Yeah, he's going to get injured. Mm-hmm. Having seen 
uh, thus it is actually with proper wisdom that clinging to these materials is actually dangerous and that uh, we might in fact be better off if we gave stuff up so that would be like a robbery that you're walking down a city street late at night or something and a guy comes up and says your money or your life there's an old joke about that uh, the joke is uh, from uh, Jack Benny and so the guy comes up to Jack Benny and says your money or your life but Jack Benny says nothing and the guy says I told you your money or your life and Jack Benny says I'm thinking I'm thinking <laughs> <laughs> And that's what we do. Yeah. We ponder, we grab the stuff so much so that we'd often be willing to die to keep it. Even if we do die, we ain't got it. Yeah. yeah. And then the next one is the analogy of burning grass. Let's say you no know, a burning grass torch. Let's say that you've got a torch on fire and you're out in the wind. If you keep holding that torch, it's, uh, the, the wind is going to burn all, uh, uh, excite the fire, and it's going to blow sparks and maybe burning material on you, you could get burned. Wouldn't it be better if the wind comes up and you're hold, carrying a torch to put that torch down? So, so this would be like alcoholism or drugs or... Mm -hmm. Gambling. Right, we don't see the danger. Gambling is one of them. Pornography would be another one. Uh, LSD and all the concoctions, methamphetamines and uh, fentanyl, all the new guides on the block, as well as the old stuff of heroin and whatnot like that. That it's dangerous if we take that stuff, but the people can't see the danger in it until the danger has already got them. And basically, what we just mentioned are like extreme forms, but really it's the same danger with those things as with smaller sensual pleasures, right? Basically mm -hmm. the same danger with every sensual pleasure. It's the same, exactly. Yeah. All right, if you go to the brothel, there's all kinds of dangers. One is the girls will laugh at you. Another yeah. one is, is that one of them will rob you. Another one is, is that while you're in the bedroom with all the girls, the cops come in and bust the place and bust <laughs> all the johns. All right. So that was one that the Buddha didn't put in here. I guess they didn't have those kind of things then. <laughs> the next one here is a charcoal pit. It's full of uh, uh, burning charcoals. It's so hot that it doesn't even give off smoke. It just gives off radiant heat. And suppose someone grabbed you by both uh, one, two people, one on each arm, and start putting you towards that pit. Wouldn't you swing and try to get yourself free? No. Okay. Well, another one would be is why don't you, with both hands, one on one guy on one side and the other guy on the other, grab hold of him very strongly and not let go and tell him if you if you throw me in here, you're both going with me. <laughs> Maybe they'll turn loose. But. That's the point is nobody wants to go into that fire pit. And yet, look, the guys jump right into that alcohol. I was just yeah. uh, seeing a YouTube video the other day about how many of the actors, Errol Flynn and John Bellucci, it seems like that someone, once they become famous and wealthy, they actually do a great deal of damage to themselves. Judy Garland. Um, Marilyn Monroe. A lot of the of childhood them. actors, they get really messed up later in life. They get really messed up. Why? Because yeah. of the sensuality that Hollywood uh, buys and sells. That's the business of Hollywood. And that the actors generally don't do well. Yeah. Only a few of them make it. And those are the ones who get out. I can name you a few of them that did get out. One was uh, Alexander uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Another one was uh, uh, I forget his name now. He, uh, the Smothers Brothers got out. 
uh, uh, Clint Eastwood got out. They survived. But most of the actors in Hollywood wind out wind up in tragic situations. They go right into that fire pit. Yeah. And they've got those producers who carry them right to the edge of the fire pit and throw them in. It's a shark, shark infested water. Mm -hmm. Then the, the, uh, the next one is dreaming. Suppose that you had a dream about a beautiful park or a grove or uh, lovely meadows or whatever paradise that you have. And then when you wake up, you recognize you don't have that. Now, that dream, in fact, could be a daydream. It doesn't have to be a night dream. But the, the dreams that we have of pleasantness is always destroyed when we wake up and we wind up not having it. Then the next example is borrowed goods. And we all are in debt. Why do we get into debt? So that we can go buy a carriage, we can go buy a bicycle or a motorbike or a house or whatever like that. And then what happens is that the bank comes back and says, oh, no, it's mine. I want it back. And so they would take back their things. What do you think, householder? Would that be enough for that man to become dejected? That you bought it or you, uh, you got money for it, you borrowed money for it, and now you're going to lose it. The next one is, uh, oh, this one is a tree. This is kind of funny. There's a tree laden with fruit, but none of it has fallen to the ground. So this guy comes and he sees that tree, fruit tree and he says, oh, I'm going to climb that tree and get some fruit. Maybe eat it and some and, and uh, put it in a bag. And then another guy, while he's in the tree, comes and he sees that tree. And he can't climb a tree, but he's got an axe. So he comes <laughs> and he cuts that tree down. What do you think? The guy that's in the tree, wouldn't he, uh, would he stop gra grabbing fruit and eating fruit long enough to recognize the tree he's in is being cut down? Wouldn't he want to <laughs> get out of the tree? Wouldn't he call the guy who's cutting the tree? Hang on just a minute. I'll give you all the fruit you want. You don't have to uh, cut the tree down. But oh no, in our greed, we think that we've got something. We climb a tree and we get a job and we do this, that, and the other thing. And here the boss comes in and he whacks that tree down. What yeah. do you think would happen? The guy in that tree, wouldn't he fall and break his leg or something? Oh, definitely. So, um, this is what happens. And so... When, when the tree falls, wouldn't he break his leg or his foot or some part of his body so that, the, uh, uh, that he might incur death or bodily suffering? And the, and the householder says, yes. So too, householder, a noble disciple considers us. Sensual pleasures have to be compared to the fruit tree. One, they provide much suffering, much despair, while the danger is great. Having seen that this is uh, actually with proper wisdom, he avoids the equanimity that he is deriving based upon the diversity of the fruit. And he develops the equanimity that is unified based on unity, where clinging to the material things of the world utterly cease without remainder. What is meant by the diversified equanimity? And well, the, the guy gets pleasure by eating this piece of fruit and that piece of fruit. The dog gets uh, equanimity by gnawing on the bone. Ah, uh, like, oh, everything's all right right now. Yeah, I feel good all right right now because I've got something that I can chew on. Right, right, okay. But the unification or the unity then is, is to be able to have a unified mind without having the physical things to try to gain 
Okay, so having arrived at that supreme mindfulness, whose equanimity is due to the equi- uh, whose purity is due to this equanimity, the noble disciple reflects uh, upon the manifold past lives. That is one birth, two births, etc. And then it references the sutta. Thus, with these uh, aspects and particulars. He recollects manifold past lives. Now, this is actually is the first of three of the three watches of the night. And the Buddha is recollect, uh, remembering that. And what we can actually see then is that this is a metaphor for if you are really mindful and that you have a good developed practice, you can remember all the little things that you've done throughout your past life. You remember when they called you names. You remembered the place. That in fact, good meditators, those who are practicing uh, uh, correctly, they begin to have memories of all kinds of stuff that they had originally forgotten. Basically, all those memories were there, but were too busy in bad feelings and remember all the bad stuff that's happened that we don't remember everything. But when we have mindfulness, when we have equanimity, then we begin to remember all kinds of things. So with that, the second one is having arrived at the same supreme mindfulness whose purity is due to equanimity with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the noble disciple sees beings arising and passing away and reappearing inferior and superior fair and ugly fortunate and unfortunate and he understands how beings pass on and according to their actions now the comma actually this is comma but you can see the comma in action here's a good example of this imagine that you're standing at the window on a building that's the second, third, or fourth floor, and down below across the street is a hardware store. And guys walk into the hardware store, and then they come out. They're not the same person who came out as the one who went in. The one who went in was wanting something, and the guy who came out may be disappointed because of the price of the hammer. They didn't have any hammers. Uh, Or he got a brand new hammer that was cheaper than he expected. And so going in and coming out is not the same thing. But you can see that in people a lot. You can see how people change their minds. They change their moods. And this is what we're talking about is the arising and passing away of beings. That beings are temporary. And yet we have the idea that, the, oh, the guy who walked into the hardware store is exactly the same guy who walked out. And the first guy who walked in was dressed in a certain way with a big fat wallet. And the guy who walked out is still dressed in that same way, but his wallet's not the same. And now he's got a great big package he's carrying. He's changed. But the third watch of the night is the one that's most important. At this point, householder, uh, the cutting off of affairs and the noble one's uh, discipline having achieved entirely and in many ways, what do you think, householder? Do you see yourself cutting off with affairs? Did I go too far? No, no, I'm right. Let me go. Do you see yourself as cutting off? Venerable sir, who am I? that I should possess this. Well, I did. Okay, I have missed something. Okay, here it is. I'll go back up. Having arrived at the same supreme mindfulness whose purity is due to equanimity by realizing for himself with direct knowledge that the noble disciple here and now enters upon and abides in deliverance of mind and that deliverance by wisdom that are taintless and with the destruction of the taints. Now, this is the third watch of the night. The one point about the third watch of the night in reality is is that the sun comes up. 
I was on watch when I was in the Navy. And the third watch is when the guys who were on watch are still on watch while all of the crew now eats breakfast. And you do not get off of watch until the crews take their stations at 8 a.m. But from 4 in the morning till 8 in the morning, at about 6, the sun comes up, and then you can really see what's going on. This is what the Buddha is referring to, is once the light is turned on, you can see what's going on, and now you can take deliverance. The example that I have is we were off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina, uh, fairly way out to where you couldn't see the city at night. Maybe just a little bit of light and whatnot, but when the sun came up, now you can see the city off from the shore. So this is an important point is that we can see clearly. And this is the third watch of the night where we understand that, yeah, we have a good memory and yeah, we can see the comings and goings of the beings. But the important point now is now that we can see our defilements, we could drop them. This is the knowledge and deliverance that the Buddha speaks of in several other suttas. One is the, uh, the Anapanasati Sutta at the end and the other one is the great 40. At the end of the sutta, it's the knowledge of being able to see that allows us to make the change of dropping our defilements. Okay, th this is very interesting. And I would like to make a point about this, uh, why I brought up this sutta. And it is because I was reading this part and then I was like, ah, I think I see what I've been missing in my practice. And the way I interpret it, it is that when I get my mind unified, uh, I should start by remembering the times I've been in other situations or similar situations before and recognizing how I end up in Dukkha each time. Mm -hmm. But I never did that before because I thought, oh, I'm, when I do that, I'm conceptualizing, I'm like making a story, but I decided to just try it. And then I noticed that for the first time, or maybe not the first, but uh, that really wisdom started to arise and that I could, uh, that finally like the tendencies started to become weaker because before I could get into the first jhana, but I never had like a weakening of the, the tendencies because, yeah, I just didn't see the danger. Right. So, so in a way, you yeah. can say that getting and sustaining the first jhana is not enough, but it's yeah. necessary. It's necessary, but not sufficient. What is necessary is to get the mind clear enough, and then the next step is to really look at what's going on. Really looking, for instance, in our past to see how we screwed up and how bad we felt. And they also to see that we're coming and going and coming and going, that we're a being this and a being that. You can be a baseball player in the afternoon, a musician in the evening, and a fart at night. We keep changing. And now that we have that vision and knowledge, we can begin to give that stuff up. That this is the real teaching of the Buddha, not being able to see past lives. That's ridiculous. But what we can see is in our past how we keep screwing up. But, yeah, th okay, so can you explain that... When you are in first jhana, yeah, you always say, like, try to stay in the present moment. So you are in the present so, moment. So you can about... see. So you can see you're in the present moment so that you can see, you can investigate. You can see but, how the mind works. Uh, you can see it going into the past. And you can see going into past without it being a hindrance. Ah, so you still go into the past while you are aware that you are going into the past. And doing and so happily 
without coming across some bad thing that happened. Now, you can actually remember the same thing, but now you're looking at it through fresh, non-hindered eyes. In the old days, when we would remember something, we would wind up not liking it. An example would be a kid falls out of a tree and breaks a leg. An example would be a motorcycle accident. But the noble can remember falling out of the tree and breaking his leg, but that's okay. And do you purposefully try to reflect on like present thoughts that come up and try to see the danger in those thoughts by going back into the past or? No, but you things that thoughts come up now, can you bring them up and see them without them being a hindrance to you being in that good state of the first jhana? Hmm. But for most people, when they're learning the first jhana, any thought that they have will pull them out of the first jhana. Because they're not seeing with wisdom. They're, so this is the whole point about the first jhana, is if you can get into the first jhana and stay there in the first jhana, now you can see all kinds of things clearly and let them go. You can see them with direct knowledge and become delivered from the feelings that you would have normally had. Ah, so basically what's happening then is that I, I started to see that I don't have to go into Dukkha when I get those those thoughts. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. All right, so we're almost yeah. finished. Let's go ahead yeah. and read the rest of it. Venerable sir, who am I? Uh, that I should possess any cutting off of affairs entirely. In other words, now that the guy understood what the Buddha is saying, he recognized why he was called a householder. Because he's still having affairs. He's got a parasol. He's got fancy clothes on. He's got the kind of sandals that you're talking about. And in all ways like that, in the noble one's uh, discipline, I am far indeed, venerable sir, from the cutting off of affairs of the nobles, uh, this discipline, when it has been uh, achieved entirely and in all ways. For, venerable sir, through the wanderings of other sects, wanderers of other sects are not thoroughbreds. We imagined they, that they were thoroughbreds. And so he was acting like a wanderer. He was acting like he, he thinks that those guys are free from their affairs. In fact, no, they were still caught up in affairs, just like many Thai monks. They still have affairs. Yeah. The ones who were telling you about your shoes, they still have shoe affairs. <laughs> yeah. Though they are not thoroughbreds. We feed them the food of thoroughbreds, though they are not thoroughbreds. We set them in the place of thoroughbreds, though the, through the uh, the bhikkhus, but through but though the bhikkhus are thoroughbreds, we imagine that they are not thoroughbreds, though they are thoroughbreds. We feed them the food of those who are not thoroughbreds, though they are thoroughbreds. We set them in the place of those who are not thoroughbreds. But now, venerable sir, as the wanderers of other sects are not thoroughbreds, we shall um, understand that they are not thoroughbreds and that they are uh, not thoroughbreds. We shall feed them the food of those who are not thoroughbreds as they are not thoroughbreds. We shall set them in the place of those who are not thoroughbreds. But as the bhikkhus are thoroughbreds, we shall understand that they are thoroughbreds and that they are thoroughbreds. We shall feed them the food of thoroughbreds as they are thoroughbreds. We shall set them in the place of those who are thoroughbreds. Venerable sir, the blessed one has inspired me uh, love for the recluses, confidence in the recluses, uh, and have reverence for the bhikkhus. 
magnificent Master Gautama. Master Gautama uh, has made the Dhamma clear in many ways as though he were turning upright what had been overturned, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to the one who was lost and holding up a lamp in the dark for those who, with eyesight, can see these things. I go to the Master Gautama for refuge and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of the Bhikkhus, for today, let Master Gautama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge, for life. Okay, that happens often. But this guy didn't ordain, but he got the teaching of the Buddha. I see that so the now Lord, he's willing to live the life of a householder and appreciate it. Before he was just pretending that he was uh, finished with his affairs, while in fact it was clear that he had not been in that state. And so th this is one thing about having affairs. Basically, another way of talking about it is having beliefs, believing in stuff, believing in a political party, Believing in a government, believing in society that it's going to be some value to you, believing in business, etc., like that. But once you have cut yourself free, then you don't hold beliefs anymore. You want to see the real deal. And so this is what that suit is about, that we can, in fact, see clearly we can tell we can see that the whole world is upside down. It's looking for love in all the wrong places. And so we we continue holding our beliefs and our affairs. And we can give that stuff up. Because we can see that it really, truly has no nourishment. There is no nourishment in drugs. There is no nourishment in the gambling. Even if you get a lot of money out of it, it's still not nourishing. Money is not nourishing. Borrowing money is not nourishing. It's going to be taken away. Is there, um, is there anything you recommend to see the dukkha more clearly, um, for example, like doing, do you actually recommend like reflecting often on like the examples the Buddha gives in the sutta, like that of the fruit tree? Yeah, you can recollect all oh, that story is a good story. I don't have to gnaw on a bone. I don't have to hoard my supply of meat. I, I don't have to uh, to jump in that fire pit. I don't have to hold that torch. Uh, and I don't have to climb a tree to get fruit. Or I can climb out of that tree before it's cut down. But that's the deliverance is the deliverance of wisdom. When you can see the way that things are headed. That guy in the tree is a good example here because he's too busy eating the fruit to recognize that the tree had been cut right out from under him. Yeah, you you often say like, uh, been there, done that. Been so, there, done that. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of uh, basically a wholesome thought mm -hmm. about seeing the that you've been in this situation before where you can fall into dukkha, but you're not going to do it. Why? Right. People talk about the monks going to India. You probably be invited already to go to India. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Okay. The whole point is that I've been to India. I've done that. I don't need to go to India. I'm okay where I am. <laughs> Don't have to go see Bodh Gaya again. Been there, done that. 
I have no desire for that. Okay, so you can say been there, done that on almost anything. That's the coming and goings of the beings. I've I'm finished. I've been there and I've come and I've gone and that's it. Yeah. Because I have the knowledge I can be delivered from such desires. So we just uh, talked about that only being in the first jhana is not enough. So what is like the extra thing that we need to do? Is that like... Right, okay. Buying a pair of binoculars is not enough. You have to put them up to your eyes and look. Maybe even adjust them so that you can look more clearly. But in in another way, you can say that looking through the binoculars and seeing things through the binoculars is still not enough. Here's the story about that. This is kind of funny. That the, um, uh, the American military was out west in the old days when there was Indians. And so the, uh, the Americans were up on the hill waiting for the Indians to come through the valley. And there the guy stood looking through the binoculars <laughs> and he sees those Indians beginning to trail through. And he's looking and he's looking and he says, we're going to get them. We're going to go to attack them. Here they come. And while he's looking through the binoculars, a whole group of Indians sneak up right behind him and capture him and his group. (laughs) So looking through the binoculars is not enough. You need to look everywhere. You need to look all around. Yeah. Okay, so this is the quality of the first jhana is to get yourself clear enough so that you can look around. One by one as they occur. One by one as they occur. You're not going to let that Indian sneak up on you just because you see some Indians down in the valley. Right, because yeah, sometimes I focus too much on one part of Anasati that I forget the other steps. Mm -hmm. You don't get that in the first genre. Right, that you integrate the body, the feelings, the mental states. In fact, in reality, mental state and feeling are so close together that there's hardly a division between them once you've got them. Yeah. Also, the distinction between the, the attitude that you have and the state of mind that you have and the thoughts you have are very, very close together. There's not a big difference anymore. And then you add the bodily component, that the feelings and the body are almost the same thing. They're so close together that there's hardly any distinction. Most people say, I feel anxious, but they don't recognize that that anxiousness that they feel as a feeling is actually a bodily sensation. Yeah, bodily tension or mental tension, like Mm -hmm. they're getting fired up. Right, they're all about the same, aren't they? So that means then we can look at everything. We can look at one and the other and the other and the other. That's what the whole point about being the first John is, that the mind is now clear enough, clean from and finished with the hindrances, so that we could take a good look around. So for the for the last four items of Anapanasati, the whole Vipassana section, basically all you have to do is just look. You don't have to reflect, contemplate. No, just look. Then in yeah. fact, the contemplation in that regard is actually one of the hindrances. But when you are using like the examples the Buddha uses, when you are reflecting on that, then you are kind of like contemplating it, right? If you can see it clearly without the hindrances, but often what happens is, is that when we start to, uh, to think and recollect, we go off into the hindrances. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Ah, so... Um... Yeah, that's that's interesting because during my yeah, during my sessions sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't work. And the only time it would work was when I'm not in hindrance to reflect. Yes. Okay. 
thank yeah, thank you so, so much. All right. Yeah. Well, I um, enjoy. I, I I remember this sutta. In fact, if you saw the book that I've got, it's could underlined all over the place. Oh, this sutta. Oh yes, this sutta. I I remember it quite well. But I'm glad to have the review. Yeah. This uh. This has been really helpful for me, Domerato. Thank you so much. Okay. We'll see ya. Yeah, we'll see ya. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.